Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. I've lived on my little farm just outside the city for as long as I can remember. My PA left it to me when he passed. God rest his soul. It ain't much. Just a cozy little house and some land for my vegetables and my goats. I love those silly beasts like they're my own kids. When old Mrs. Jenkins moved away last fall, I hoped we'd get another friendly neighbor, maybe a nice young family with some kids for my goats to entertain. Boy, was I wrong. The new owner was a piece of work, I tell ya. Right from the start, she rubbed folks the wrong way, stuck her nose up at everyone in town. Then she had the nerve to start complaining about living so close to a farm. Can you believe it? She knowingly bought a house next to a farm and then acted shocked when there were animals making noise. This lady, who I'll call Karen because she was sure acting like one, didn't take too kindly to my goats getting close to her fence line. She'd come stomping over and yell at them to shoo, as if a goat understands English. I tried to be polite and explain they don't mean no harm, just being curious goats as they are. But she wouldn't have it. Kept on screeching about how she wouldn't tolerate filthy beasts on her property. Well, I started keeping a closer eye on my mischievous goats to make sure they stayed clear of her place. But goats will be goats, as they say, and those rascals somehow got loose one afternoon when I was fixing the tractor. Darn critters made a beeline straight for Karen's backyard, no doubt smelling her flower bushes. By the time I realized they were gone and raced over, it was too late. Those goats had eaten every last blossom off her prized rose bushes. I couldn't help but chuckle seeing her shrieking and waving her arms with fury. But I tried to apologize sincerely and offered to make up for her lost flowers. Thought that would be the end of it. I brought my goats back home and gave them a good scolding for sneaking off. Figured I'd best keep them penned up for a few days just to avoid any more trouble. I decided I'd go to the nursery, buy some new rose bushes, and plant them for Karen as a peace offering. But before I could do that, something seemed off with my goats. They weren't their usual spirited selves, just lying around, barely eating or playing. Then I noticed some strange marks on their skin, looked almost like burns. My heart dropped into my stomach. I suddenly remembered that just last week, Karen had asked me what types of chemicals and fertilizers I used on my farm, said she was just curious, being new to the country and all. I thought nothing of it at the time. But now those wounds on my beloved goats looked an awful lot like some kind of reaction. I felt sick, thinking Karen might have tried to poison my innocent creatures just for nibbling some roses. What kind of monster would do something so heartless? I loaded the goats into the pickup and raced them over to the vet, praying they would be okay. Doc took one look at the marks and confirmed my worst fears. Some sort of toxic chemical reaction. Thankfully, he was able to treat them, but it cost me nearly $200. Still reeling from the news, I drove straight to Karen's house and pounded on the door. The instant she opened it, I let loose on her, demanding to know why she'd try to kill my goats. The woman didn't even flinch, just stood there in her fancy silk bathrobe looking bored, inspecting her manicure. Those disgusting beasts ruined my prize roses, she said flatly like it was no big deal. They're lucky all I did was teach them a little lesson to keep off my property. Filthy creatures carrying who knows what diseases. They deserved what they got. I was seeing red. Through gritted teeth I told her I'd be sending a vet bill for two hundred dollars and I expected her to pay every penny. Well. She let out this shrill laugh in my face, said I didn't have a shred of proof she'd done anything to harm those worthless animals. That tore it. I got right up in her face and told her if she didn't pay the bill, I'd take her to court so fast it'd make her spoiled head spin, and I'd make sure the whole town knew what a shriveled up heart she had too. For a second I thought I saw a flash of fear in her eyes, but it vanished quick. She raised her chin and said, I'm calling the police right now. You get off my property and stay away from me, you crazy fool. I'll admit I lost my cool when she slammed the door in my face. Put my fist right through her living room window. Not my finest moment, but I was just so darn furious. This woman had come into our town and poisoned my beloved goats without a lick of remorse. Soon enough, the cops showed up. Karen was wailing on the front porch, going on about how I attacked her home and threatened her. The officers had to hold me back as I shouted at her to tell them the truth. Thankfully, one of the deputies was Bobby Mills, a guy I'd known since grade school. I managed to explain everything to him, and he agreed to come take a statement from my vet about the goat's injuries. I could tell Bobby believed me, though he said he still had to do his job and file a report on the whole mess. I understood and agreed to pay for Karen's window. 
Over the next week, I gathered up all the medical records from my vet proving those goat injuries were no accident. I presented them to Bobby along with the $200 bill and a letter formally demanding Karen pay it, or else I'd file suit. He agreed to deliver the documents and letter to her. Later that day, a fancy envelope showed up in my mailbox containing a check for $200. The cowardly woman didn't even include a note, but I guess she got the message clear enough. I considered us square after that, or so I thought. A few days later, I was working in the field when I saw a county truck pulling up with two officials looking real serious. They introduced themselves as being from the county agricultural department, said they were following up on a report that my farm had unsafe and unsanitary conditions. I was floored. Come to find out, Karen had filed a formal complaint against me, claiming my farm was a disease-ridden death trap. She even had pictures of my poor goats when they were sick and injured. Of course, she conveniently left out that she was the one who hurt them in the first place. I showed the men around and explained the whole story about that Karen lady poisoning my goats and then having the gall to report me for animal cruelty. Thankfully, they could see plain as day that my farm was clean and safe as could be. The goats were happy and healthy again, too. Before leaving, one of the officials advised me that I could file a harassment report against this woman. Seems I wasn't the first person she'd tried to cause trouble for. Bobby later told me she had a reputation around town for being a bully. She'd filed complaints on neighbors for the most minor or made-up offenses, trying to get people fined or in trouble. Real mean, spiteful behavior. I'd had enough of this woman's games. It was time to fight back. I filed an official harassment complaint and also spoke to a lawyer buddy of mine. He helped me take Karen to court for the slander, false complaints to the county, and emotional distress she'd caused me. We presented all the evidence showing I'd done nothing wrong, and that Karen was just a mean, miserable person trying to make my life hell. In the end, the judge ordered her to pay me a good chunk of money in damages, saying he would not tolerate such despicable bullying and lying behavior in his courtroom or community. Karen was also prohibited from filing any more complaints about me unless there was substantial proof of wrongdoing, which we all knew would never happen. Karen ended up selling her house just a few months later and getting run out of town for good. I tell you, the day that moving truck pulled away was one of the happiest days of my life. Good riddance to that woman. She had a lot of nerve poisoning my precious goats and then trying to destroy my whole livelihood. But in the end, I got justice. My goats are doing just fine now, frolicking and getting into mischief as always. And I learned to keep a closer eye on them, just in case any more Karens come around these parts. But something tells me this town has had its fill of those types. I'm just glad I could stand up to her bullying and show folks around here don't take too kindly to that kind of mean-spiritedness. The next one is a pro-revenge story. Obligatory backstory. Many of you have probably heard of families with a strong hierarchical structure, typically with the eldest in the family having the most influence. My family is one of them, except that my parents are drug addicts and deadbeats, so my eldest sister, 31F, our entitled mother, raised all five of us. She is the boss of the family. She says, jump and everyone says, how high? The focal point of the story is my youngest sister, 20F, who I'll call little sister. Most of us have a handful, or at least a couple of memories with our mother before she lost her mind, except for little sister. For her, entitled mother is the only mom she ever had, and entitled mother knows how to take advantage of that. All of us moved out of our parents' house as soon as we turned 18, except for entitled mother, who waited until little sister and our brother were raised and in their mid-teens to move across the country and soon found jobs and accommodations for all of us to move to the same state as her. Little sister begged for years to move in with her, but entitled mother always denied it, saying that somebody had to take care of our father and that she and her new husband needed privacy and space. That was until entitled mother got pregnant. She got little sister to move in with her, and she has been there for the past two and a half years, helping out. Now to the story. Entitled father's family wanted to visit for a couple of weeks, so little sister had to stay with me during that time so they could use her room. It's worth noting that entitled mother didn't ask or let me know about it. She just dropped little sister off. One day she saw me studying for my master's degree and said something about how she always wanted to go to college and this is how it went. Me. So why don't you? Little sister. Oh, I talked to Entitled Mother about it, but she said not everyone is the college type and that I wouldn't have time to work, study, and take care of niece at the same time. And it's expensive. Me. Most people work and study at the same time and she can put niece in a daycare. I'm sure it wouldn't be that much more expensive than what she's already paying you. 
Little sister. She doesn't pay me, she already gives me food and shelter, and if I need money, I just take a shift at work. And this is how I learned my sister was not only babysitting, but also cleaning the whole house for free every day. She was even working only eight hours a week at her normal job because she was too busy taking care of our niece. Long story short, it took me weeks to convince her to apply to community college, and then more weeks on the actual process, but she finally got confirmation she would start in September. All of that behind entitled mother's back. She was planning on telling everyone the next time we all got together, which would be Independence Day. But before that could happen, entitled mother got everyone together at her house to announce that she was pregnant. Little sister started crying because now she wouldn't be allowed to go to college. Entitled mother got deeply hurt and offended that she planned this behind her back. I butt in. Our other siblings butt in. It's just generally a mess. How could you do this to me? Who's going to take care of the babies? I can't believe you'd be so selfish. If you like OP so much, go stay with her. These were all some of the things she said. She kicked me and little sister out, who stayed with me until they made peace. Both of our siblings reached out, one to say that I should have minded my own business, and the other to tell me she was on my side but wouldn't say anything. After that, little sister moved back with her and didn't go to college. But they agreed she would get paid $6 an hour and be allowed to take more shifts at her job until the baby is born and then go to real college after the child turns one year old. I know it's messed up, but all of them, especially little sister, worship entitled mother like a god. I waited a year to act on my revenge, making sure my sister had saved enough money to live on her own. The revenge. First, what I did was research the legality of paying a homeless person in food and shelter. In the U.S. and depending on the state, it's legal as long as you do not cross the line and the person becomes an employee. For example, you can give the person a list of tasks you want done. However, you cannot say that it has to be done in a certain amount of time. You also cannot request someone to be somewhere at a certain time. You can ask, but not demand on the time. It comes down to a choice of words. Also, you have to comply with rental laws. If your local laws say that you must give 30 days notice to a tenant, then you must give 30 days notice to this person as well. I had proof of all of the situations, several screenshots of entitled mother admitting not paying and not allowing little sister to move out, get a job, and also admitting to kicking her out whenever she wanted. All this technicality seemed worthless, since no one would sue her. But that didn't matter. I just wanted to make sure that her boss knew that if she were to be sued, it would be a sure case. Entitled Mother works for a civil rights attorney's office, so discovering she has a literal modern-day slave would probably get her fired. I could have just created a burner email and sent it all to her boss, but then they would explain to her why she's getting fired, and that would get me and little sister in trouble. So what did I do? Entitled mother was always complaining about one of the bosses at her job that hated her and had tried to get her fired for ages. I went to the company site, found the woman, thankfully she was the only Ashley that worked there, found her on Instagram and Facebook. There she had a post tagging her yoga studio, went to said studio and created my membership. Took a few weeks of trial and error trying to find exactly what class Ashley belonged to, but I finally found her. Then I went to yoga class every Tuesday and Friday at 8 a.m. for months, slowly building a friendship with her. Around three months in, she asked to follow me on Instagram, and I was already prepared for this scenario, having deleted the few pictures I had with Entitled Mother. After nine months, when our friendship was a strong baby, I brought up the crazy coincidence that I found out she worked with Entitled Mother. Before things could get awkward, I said, It's ironic that she works for civil rights considering, you know, everything. That got Ashley's attention. I told her everything, showed every screenshot. I could practically see her eyes shining. They had their own history that is not important to the story. All you need to know is, entitled mother is an idiot. Ashley wants revenge as much as I do. I told her about little sister's situation and why entitled mother couldn't ever know about this. This is why being friends with Ashley was so important. If I had just sent them the proof and explained the situation, they would have probably just ignored it, since this was a very legitimate reason to fire her and they wouldn't risk firing her for a minor mistake and maybe getting sued. I sent her the files with her promise that Entitled Mother wouldn't hear about this, but she needed it to convince the other owner, who was the reason why she wasn't fired yet. Two months later, Entitled Mother was fired for minor mistakes, lateness, and general bad productivity. A small victory, sure, but I loved coming to visit her during the four months she was unemployed. She was looking so tired and miserable all the time since she had no money to pay for a babysitter, 
and little sister is away at college, so she actually had to take care of her children. The next one is a petty revenge story. I came from work, and after arriving home, I just took the grocery list and went shopping at the market next to my house. I bought all I needed, went to the cashier, and after finishing putting all the items on the conveyor, I realized that I missed a couple of items. The guy in front of me was finishing and about to pay, so I told the cashier, and she gave me a thumbs up to go for the items. So I went for them rather quickly, not because I was in a hurry, but not to make anyone behind me wait in case the cashier was quick processing everything. I came back, and the cashier was just beginning to process my groceries. Also, a lady in her late forties was unpacking her shopping already. I just tried to interrupt her for a second, but she just scoffed at me and completely ignored me each time I tried to address her. I guess she thought I just wanted to take the couple of items I had in my hand and decided that over her dead body or something similar. So, well, I wasn't in a hurry, and the cashier just gave me a seriously and tired look. I could have gone past the cashier's area and just do it from the front, but she annoyed me and I felt petty, so I simply waited. The cashier finished processing my items on the belt and just stopped. I truly believe she really wanted that rest because she didn't say anything to me. So we waited and waited five minutes after the lady in front of me was tapping her feet and puffing, and after another five minutes, she asked a bit rudely to the cashier, where the heck was the person who had the groceries before her? To which the cashier responded with a smile, He is behind you, but you didn't let him pass earlier. If looks could kill, she grumblingly let me pass. I gave the cashier my items, and of course I paid in cash and took my sweet time to find in my wallet the exact amount of money it was because I know that late in the afternoon the markets here can be low on cash. I wasn't able to find the exact amount, but yes, something close to it and with nice huffing and puffing as background music. I just said goodbye to the cashier, gave another smirk goodbye to the lady, and went on my merry way back home. As I said at the beginning, nothing fancy, just petty, which put a smile on my face after a long day of work. The next one is a malicious compliance story. I, 25F, have a friend, 25, who has been wanting me to play Breath of the Wild for years now. It's not that I'm not interested in playing, heck, I bought the game ages ago. I've just been more invested in other things. After five or so years, I finally cracked down to play and absolutely love it. My friend is equally excited and can't wait for me to get to their favorite parts. No, literally, they can't wait. Almost daily, I'm hounded with DMs asking how I like the game. Did I meet A yet? Have I done B yet? Have I finished C quest? Why is it taking so long for me to finish C quest? I prefer taking things at my own pace. With a game of this scale, I want to take my sweet time exploring and finding things as I go. I feel like I'm progressing through the plot at a decent pace, 50 hours into a game that other people have spent 300 on, and I'm doing fun side quests. Also, I have other hobbies, and I've been playing the game along with the other things going on in my life. I've told them as much, and they're not very happy about it. At first, they were supportive, if not a little pushy, for me to play the game. When I'd talk about certain plot points and gameplay that I enjoyed, they'd brush off my gushing and say things like, Oh, you haven't seen anything yet. You're not ready. Keep going. As I juggled between the game's two main missions, they pushed me to do one over the other because it's where the good stuff happens. Despite me saying multiple times that I wanted to go at my own pace and do both missions together, they hounded me with more messages about how I wasn't playing right and I need plot. I talked to them about it probably dozens of times, and they explained that they were so pushy because they needed someone else to talk about the game with. No, they wouldn't stop hounding me. I needed to keep going. For them. For our friendship. I thank them later. Speedrun. So I thought, to heck with it. They want me to speedrun, then I'll speedrun. I used guides and read up on things to finish the game as quickly as I could. I honestly have no clue what I did or how I finished, but I did. I eventually sent them a screen cap of my finished game file and gave them my honest opinion. I hated it. There was no build-up to anything. I didn't know any character well enough to be invested in their struggles, and the puzzles ranged from stupidly easy to unnecessarily complicated. That part of the game that they couldn't wait for me to find? Skipped over the dialogue. It wasn't worth the extra time. After all, I needed to finish the game as soon as possible, right? Needless to say, we're not friends anymore. Now that I've returned to my original save file and am playing how I want, I can say that BoTW is one of the best games I've played. Since I skipped over so much for the sake of being petty, a lot of things still feel new. I have no shortage of other friends to talk about the game with, and thankfully these ones encourage me to take my time. They can't wait for me to get to their favorite parts, 
but not literally. They'll wait however long it takes me. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.